Good morning. I'd like to thank you for once again joining us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. A few years ago, my wife Trista and I were living on the coast after a hurricane. Usually when a hurricane comes ashore, you lose power, and well, this time was no different. Living without electricity for a few hours is inconvenient, but when those hours stretch into days, you quickly realize how that minor inconvenience can cause your whole life to come to a stop. Everything in our refrigerator spoiled, and we had canned food and stapled goods, but our stove didn't work. Neither did the chargers for our cell phones or our computers or fans or anything. But it wasn't just power in our house. Without electricity, the gas pumps didn't work either. So not only did we not have power, there was a fuel shortage. Nobody was able to use their generators or even their cars. In an instant, life was reduced to the very basics. And and in reality, life became a lot more time-consuming. I mean, if you wanted something to eat, you couldn't just throw it in the microwave. You had to start a fire at the grill. If you wanted to go somewhere, you had to walk. I remember thinking there was a time in history not too long ago that nobody had electricity. People thrived without power. In the ancient world, though, more or less everything that is done today by electricity and gas was was done by slaves. For bad or for worse, that's the culture that Peter's living and writing this letter in. So I don't want you to read his words and think he's trying to defend slavery. Slavery is nothing more than dehumanization. A slave's the property of their owner who often just gave them enough room and board so that they could get their job done the next day. And often as property, the slaves were mistreated. They were physically or sexually abused, exploited in a thousand different ways. Yet in his culture, the Greek philosophers often said it was impossible to talk about injustice being done to a servant because servants were just property. So when Peter writes about injustice happening to a servant, he's actually elevating the servant into the status of an actual person. And not just a person. Someone that Jesus loved enough to die for. Peter's saying that God's grace Well, it levels the playing field so that we're all the same in Christ. And while everybody would agree that slavery is an atrocity, we we need to be careful. Because whenever you point a finger at someone or something else, there's always a finger being pointed back at you. I mean, we don't want to talk about it, but we also live in a culture that's built around people we often ignore, people that we don't see or care for. Today, I imagine you're going to find yourself in the presence of people who work long hours for minimum wages. They can't take off time to be sick or to look for another job. They, they might have a family to support, and they're living hand to mouth. So if they were to lose even a single day's wage, it would be disastrous. And while we might claim to be a free nation and free people, the truth is there's no freedom in their lives. So this morning, Peter does something that's far more creative than just pointing a finger I think you're probably not surprised that a lot of Christian communities were made up of slaves. Everybody wants to know they have value and worth, especially people who are constantly told your only value comes from the service you provide. So in a sense, it makes perfect sense that slaves would have flocked to Jesus based on the dignity and self-worth his invitation offers them. That's why we find Peter addressing his brothers and sisters who are Christian slaves. And instead of telling them they need to rise up and to revolt against their masters, he says, you need to obey, show respect. And he stresses, not only when the masters are kind and fair-minded, but especially when they're being unjust. It helps me when I remember that this entire letter is built around suffering. Peter's writing to suffering people, and the remarkable thing is he's not writing to comfort them. He's writing to give them direction, marching orders. We already talked about how the the book culminates in chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, where Peter says, live like an alien, fight like a soldier, behave like a representative. In our text this morning, Peter's applying that call to how we suffer. We suffer. 
I would imagine I'm not, I'm not the only person who doesn't like to suffer. I mean, I don't even like minor difficulties. I don't like being obstructed on the road when I'm trying to get somewhere. I, I want to design my life and have it work out according to my plan. So Peter's words are important. He recognizes this gross injustice that's often done to slaves or other people that we don't see. People that are invisible, that we only find worth in their production. He reminds us that in those moments of injustice, your responsibility is to live submissively to the authority of God, to do what's good, to be respectful. Not only to people that are gentle and good, but to those that are unjust. Peter's not afraid to deal with each of us that struggle with suffering. He knows it's easy to believe that, you know, I deserve better than this, or to look at other people and say, I know they deserve what they're getting, but I don't, I don't deserve to suffer like that. So Peter's confronting our self-righteousness, our feelings of entitlement. He confronts us by sharing three very significant principles on suffering. The very first thing that Peter wants to do is he goes back to this inescapable theme that's seen all throughout the New Testament, and that's Christians were called to suffer. You see, suffering's not a failure of the plan. It doesn't mean God forgot what he promised or that he's unfaithful. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Suffering is the very center of God's will for his people. Look back at verse 19. For when God is pl- for God is pleased when conscious of his will you patiently endure unjust treatment of course you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently God is pleased with you for God called you to do good even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered for you he's your example and you must follow in his steps Peter says that you are called to be a representative of Jesus by suffering moments of injustice for his kingdom. He's pretty clear that this is not suffering because of our own sin, weakness, or failure. The the truth is that most of the suffering that we endure is the result of our own rebellion. We have this great ability to complicate our own lives. Can we just take a moment here to admit that sometimes the things that we call persecution or really not persecution. Sometimes Christians can get pretty arrogant and self-righteous. There are times when Christians kind of look down their noses at people who don't know the Lord the way they know them. And so when we get pushback from that, we want to cry that we're being persecuted. Maybe we need to admit that we have the ability to turn God's message of undeserved grace into our reason for pride. We can't confuse the anger that people have with that attitude with the suffering that Peter's talking about in this passage. Peter says that when you suffer for doing good, for doing kingdom work, that kind of suffering is a gracious thing. And so Peter goes back and he restates some things that he's already written in the letter. He's already said that that our willingness to suffer, to lose our reputation and our possessions, can only be found in worship. You see, you're only able to sacrifice everything when God becomes the most valuable treasure in your heart. When you reach the point that nothing in your life is more important than God, His love and His grace, that's when you understand the beauty of suffering for Him. When you worship God that way, God's honored. Peter also makes it clear that God calls us to moments of trial and difficulty because those are the moments that God can show us His grace. God uses hard moments in our lives to to take us beyond the boundaries, to to, to pry the things of this world, the things that we try to worship and put in His place out of our hands. You see, we want to look at the creation to give us rest and to give us hope and to give us joy. And yet God calls us to rely on Him completely. Peter says it's a gracious thing to suffer unjustly because that's the moment that God changes you. And Peter's already written that God uses suffering as our witness to a world that's watching us. Never forget, you've been called to be a representative of God in this community. And so being his representative goes so much farther than what you do for an hour in a building on a Sunday morning. You're to live as his representative wherever God placed you. And by what you say, 
and by how you live. And so Peter reminds us that we've been called to suffer, but he also says that we need to use Jesus as our example in suffering. Continuing in verse 21, he says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He's your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. I've told you before that that we have this amazing ability to trouble our trouble. Our sinful nature uh, gives us and provides a lot of ways to make our own suffering worse. So Peter says, look at Jesus as an example of how to suffer. You see, suffering doesn't change the rules. It doesn't give me permission to do things that God hasn't called me to do. Actually, in times of suffering, it's more important to believe that I am who God calls me to be and not allow my morality, my attitude, or my behavior to be dictated by outside circumstances. I completely understand that when you're sick, it's easier to get irritable. When you're having a bad day, then you want folks around you to know that, right? I mean, when you're having a bad day, well, then it's okay to kind of let your guard down and to do things that you know you shouldn't do or have a poor attitude that causes you to say things you shouldn't say. And we justify that because we're suffering. And that makes it okay, right? Peter says a thousand times, no. Look at Jesus as your example. Jesus not only endured the torture of the cross, he experienced humiliation and embarrassment as people spit on him. And in the face of all that suffering, Peter says he never sinned, never deceived anyone, didn't retaliate when he was insulted or or threatened to revenge on the people that were causing him to suffer? Jesus never tried to deal with his pain and suffering by compromising the truth of who he was. He never tried to hurt people that were hurting him. He didn't get down and dirty. He didn't try to plot revenge. He was committed to the Father. Here was the Son of God who possessed great and awesome power. It's like that song we used to sing when I was a little kid, He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free, but he didn't do all that. He was unwilling to do that because he believed in the presence, the power, the wisdom, and the sovereignty of his Father. Jesus didn't believe that the world was driven by fate. He didn't believe that the driving force of the world and our circumstances was chaos. Jesus was there when God entered the chaos and brought peace and order And he believed that God was still in the business of coming into chaos and bringing peace. And he believed that because he knew the Father. And he knew that God was everything that is right, true, and good. The question that we face every time we suffer is, do we believe that? And and that's a belief that does more than just get you in a building on a Sunday morning. Do you really believe that God is good when you're facing and receiving treatment you don't deserve? Peter doesn't downplay the fact that we're going to suffer. He never excuses the fact that we're going to suffer. Peter had suffered in his life. He loved people that had suffered, and he even saw Jesus suffer. He acknowledges that as long as we live in this broken world, there are going to be times of suffering. So he points us back to Jesus as our example on how to glorify God our Father, even in the midst of our suffering. And that brings us to the last thing Peter has to say this morning, and that's in the midst of our suffering, we need to understand Jesus is our substitute. Peter says he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. For by his wounds you are healed. Essentially, Peter says in our moments of unjust suffering, we're to remind ourselves of the gospel. It's easy to forget that our deepest struggle in suffering is not the actual suffering. Our deepest struggle is our sin. Does that make sense? Peter's saying that the more that we're suffering, that we need to understand that our greatest struggle is the sin in our lives that causes us to make such a mess of what's happening. The greatest problem is not the things happening on the outside of our lives, it's what's happening in our hearts 
It's our sin. That's the thing that destroys and complicates our lives. Sin complicates moments of blessing as well as moments of suffering. Your greatest need in life was addressed at the cross so that in moments of suffering we could experience grace. We could have the victory. In times of suffering, in those moments of injustice, we need to remember that our greatest problem in life exists in our heart, not out in the world. Jesus entered into our sin. He offered us salvation. And so when we go to the tables, when we gather in times of victory, and when we gather in times of struggle and suffering and pain, we gather because Jesus carried our sins to the cross. When we take the bread, we're reminded that this very moment we have a shepherd who lovingly watches over our souls. When we take the cup, we're reminded of his forgiveness and the depth of his forgiveness. Peter's calling us to remember Jesus just doesn't offer past forgiveness or future hope. He's pointing to the here and now. There is a right now aspect to the gospel. We gather at the table to remember Jesus shed his blood so that in difficult moments we would have the power to say no to sin and to do what's right. We gather at the table to remember the crucifixion, the singular and most unjust, wicked act the world has ever seen. Here was the one man who deserved nothing but praise and gratitude and worship, and yet they rejected him, tortured him, Killed him. But we also gather to remember the power of the resurrection, the time when our suffering and pain finally comes to an end, when we finally get to see our Father face to face. This morning, I hope that we can begin to understand how important it is for Peter to say what he does about slaves and masters. He isn't simply recommending that people remain passive while suffering violence. He's urging us to realize that somehow the suffering of our Messiah not only provides you and I the means by which we are rescued from our own sin, but that the suffering of Christ and the suffering of us is the only way that our world will finally realize peace. It's hard to believe. So many times it seems like Peter's just kind of filling space and trying to avoid the real issue of suffering and pain, but I think Peter understands better than we that the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the point at which everything else in the world revolves. As we go to the table this morning, I would imagine Peter wants us to see all of that unjust suffering, all the unjust suffering that God's people have endured, how that's made right through the suffering of Jesus. That's why we go to the tables. And so this morning as we go to the tables, I want us to do some things. First, I want us to rejoice in the fact that God allows us to suffer so that we will be more like our Savior who died for our sins. But I also want us to be aware of those invisible people in our communities, people that we ignore and oftentimes don't see or only recognize them for what they produce. And I want us to look for opportunities to love them and to remind them that they have value and they have worth. Because we go to the table as a reminder that at the foot of the cross, we're all equal. We're all equally loved and valued by God. And so I pray you have a great time at the table this morning. I pray that you remember that you are deeply and completely loved by God. I pray that you have a wonderful week, that you go in peace. I look forward to seeing you very soon.